Yeah, so just before we begin, um, we just want to acknowledge that the University of uh, Western Australia is on the Wadjuk people's land and we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of the land and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. Um, yeah, this week, Ash, we've been chatting, so we're quite excited to welcome you today. Um, you're, um, everyone, um, Ash is a postdoctoral fellow at the Vitalities Lab at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. She has written her debut novel called Into the Sea, which is an example of sociological fiction. I was hoping to get my hands on this book before today, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it hasn't arrived. Hopefully soon. Um, she's also the creator of and editor of So Far Zine. Did I say that correct? Zine. Zine. Yep. There we go. Yep. <laughs> A publication dedicated to short stories, poetry and visual art inspired by social science. And today her presentation is on sociological fiction. So thank you, Ash, for coming. And over Thanks, to you. Thanks, Dorinda. Thank yeah. you so much for the invitation. We were just chatting before this. I was saying I love talking about this work, so I'm so glad to be able to do so with you all today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see this? Yeah, that's great. Great. I, um, I don't have slides, but this is the website that you'll just be able to access later if you are interested um, in following up anything that I do talk about. I'll... Um, I'll post the link in the chat as well so that you can access it. I'll do that later. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you so much for having me. As, um, as Dorinda said, I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New South Wales. I've been here for about, um, yeah, a little over 12 months now. Before that, I was based at Griffith University. Um, and what I'm talking about today is my absolute passion project, which is sociological fiction. Um, Rather than define what sociological fiction is, I thought I'd just give some examples of the kind of work that I um, like to draw on, some of the projects that I'm involved in, um, and some of the work that I've written myself. And hopefully, maybe we in the Q&A part, we can talk about what maybe is and what isn't sociological fiction, if we can easily define something like that. So what I'll, um, what I'll do today is, talk about some of the motivations I have for engaging in this kind of creative work that I really do approach as a kind of creative public sociology um, and overview some of the landscape that this work has developed from. I'm going to talk about three of the projects that I've been involved in over the past couple of years. Um, so Zine, the fiction at the sociological review short story series that I edit as well, um, and my novel, which was recently published, um, as mentioned, called Into the Sea. So I wanted to start by, by flagging this question, which is a question from Michael Burrowey's um, well-known lecture from the 2004 American Sociological Association annual conference. It was published in, in 2005 called For Public Sociology. If, um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it you do. It's quite a well-known text within the contemporary turn to, to public sociology as a, as a project beyond um, beyond a kind of translation exercise or, or beyond a late stage public engagement type work that we might do as academics to try and raise our profiles. Um, he, he really kind of commits to public sociology as a much bigger and much more significant project than that kind of work. And this question in that I think speaks to more than the public part of sociology. And so that's why I wanted to flag it first of all, because it's something that definitely underlies um, all the work that I do and the projects that I'll speak about. For whom and for what do we pursue sociology? So I think this question and, and what Barraway really gets to in this piece is that thinking about this question can take us beyond a model of public sociology as about being a, the effective deliverance of, of our knowledge to publics. Um, to, to something that's a much more um, holistic and creative and political project um, that we might engage throughout the life cycle of research projects or as an ongoing um, commitment that we have as scholars. And some of the participatory developments in social research um, have really kind of unsettled this view on the role of scholars lately. Um, but I think that it still kind of persists especially in how we go about um, public engagement. 
So I wanted to just foreground that first of all as a key big question that underlies all of this work that I think is really important to um, recenter all of the time in our, in our especially our public engagement um, exercises. I also wanted to return to the sociological imagination. This is such a foundational text in um, it's taught, I think, in almost every introductory sociology course around the world. And actually, I think that we, we can have very little engagement with it as scholars once we've come through our undergraduate studies. But I do think that it's something really, really important to return to. Um, I've definitely found it incredibly fruitful for this kind of fiction work that I've been engaged in, um, not only because of the parallels between sociological imagination and that imagination work that's involved in writing fiction, but also to think about what Mills talks about when he when he speaks of the sociological imagination. So he defines it as something that enables us to grasp the interplay between man and society, biography and history and self and world. And what I really get from, from Mills's work when I do return to it and, and kind of take it seriously as something more than an introductory text for our very early learning students is that Sociological imagination is something that we do. It's something active that we're involved in. It's an active imagining, um, something that we kind of carry with us as a way of seeing the world. And the appendix of Mills's book, which is also really well, um, really well cited and engaged with in that introductory undergraduate sociology context, is when he talks about the sociological imagination as a craft. And when talking about this work as a craft, reading and writing are essential practices to the work of sociology. So in engaging with fiction, that's something that I'm really conscious of, that it's, um, well, as I'll talk about, we can use fiction as a form of, um, as a research method, as a form of data generation. Um, it's also, I think, an, an essential part of what it means to be a sociologist and a, and a kind of critical social researcher is to practice that craft and the twin practices of reading and writing as essential to the to the work that we do and the labor that we do as academics. And it, it can also help us think about what Mills talks about when he talks about sociology, the promise of sociology or the promise of, of the social sciences in the world. Um, especially when he talks about how they are under-realized compared to, compared to other fields that are also interested in the complexities of social relationships and basically how people are people together. Um, and the promise that Mills talks about is both an assurance and a potential. So it's something that can help us um, address injustices in society, better understand how people do and can live together. Um, but it's also something that we must commit to as a craft. It's, it's a potential and something that we can work towards. And I really do see fiction as something that is um, generative as a practice in this space, that it's, um, when I talk about fiction here, I'm, I'm talking about kind of fiction as a product, but also fiction as a process. Um, and, and the, the work that Mills does around craft and around sociological imagination is entirely uh, central to that. So I wanted to flag some of the key people who I draw on when I, when I talk about this kind of work. Um, so this is both people who write about public sociology um, and people who, um, Patricia Levy writes a lot on arts-based research and um, Gaiman and Metcalf and Gain and Back um, do a lot of um, more standard sociological work that isn't specifically focused on public sociology or necessarily on method. Um, the key one, of course, is Gaiman and Metcalf's argument that all sociologists write stories. I think this ties nicely into Levy's um, methodological arguments, um, which I've got down here, where she argues in kind of qualifying the creative turn and the uptake of arts-based research methods across social research, that fiction is a natural extension of what many qualitative researchers already do. Agar, who writes about public sociology specifically, um, he sees sociology as a literary activity to be pursued in order to make good ideas about social change accessible. Um, this idea of accessibility is one that I've written on before when talking about the potential of the novel as a form for doing public sociology. And I think something interesting that fiction can do is, is take us beyond frames of accessibility. Um, 
and I'll, um, I'll return to that later. Um, I also like this, this piece by Gain and Back is actually a piece that critically revisits Mills' sociological imagination 50 years on. Um, and this point in particular is what I wanted to highlight that uh, exactly as I was talking about before, the further quality to Mills' idea of the craft is that of literary craftsmanship. They argue for sociology to be effective, especially beyond the academy, but I really argue also um, within the academy for ourselves and our own development as sociologists. It must have literary ambitions. So it's from these kinds of arguments that I am trying to push the creative boundaries of the discipline and encourage people to, um, to write fiction, to use fiction in their work, um, to learn from fiction, not just kind of um, submit fiction to the sociological gaze, but uh, learn from literature as well. Um, I just wanted to, to name drop a few people whose work I hope that you do go and check out from a library or elsewhere. Uh, these are leading sociologists who have written novels or other fiction writers who um, do really, really interesting work that is often called ethnographic or sociological in some kind. Um, so these scholars up here all wrote significant novels over their lifetime. Um, du Bois talked about the Dark Princess series that he wrote being his favorite work that he produced. Um, Zora Neale Hurston is a very well-known anthropologist who also um, wrote some incredible novels um, across her lifetime. Um, Raymond Williams is, is really well known in the, is the kind of sociology of culture approaches and especially around sociology of literature. Um, but also, also wrote fiction and, and there's some really interesting work out there around, um, around his work on sci-fi, um, sci-fi scholars looking at Raymond's um, work on, on culture. Um, and Anne Oakley, of course, as well as a prolific, a prolific feminist sociologist whose um, 91 book, The Men's Room, was actually um, worked up into a BBC mini series, which I also recommend it has, goes by the same name, The Men's Room. Um, these are some scholars who, sorry, some writers who scholars often talk about as being particularly ethnographic or sociological, as I said, or who feature um, in social science reading lists. If you're looking for texts to enjoy yourselves or novels to um, recommend to your student, I highly recommend Googling some of those lists. Just so you can just search social science fiction um, and there's a lot of kind of reading lists on good reason things that people have curated around these ideas um, which are e excellent excellent um, books just even if for your own literary pleasure um, there's also a great article that i've only come across recent actually by jacob and larson which is on ethnographic fiction in cultural geography the ethnographic novel is perhaps the best well-known text from the scholarly side, I think, of, of work that blends scholarship and literary writing. Um, you know, Geertz talked a lot about faction as, as, as something that exists in this space when he was meditating more on the form um, rather than the, um, yeah, I suppose rather than the intent of, of, of doing this kind of work. Um, so also highly recommend um, looking at up that work if you're not familiar with it and are interested in that. So I just wanted to cover some of the key ways that people have turned to fiction in a more contemporary sense. These are by no means exhaustive, but these are three of the ways that I see people turning to fiction today. Um, so the first one, of course, is as an object or a kind of um, data source for analysis. Um, this has kind of developed over three key periods around the sociology of literature and culture. Um, Raymond Williams, who I mentioned, who wrote novels, was a big scholar in this field as well. Um, there's also significant work done around the sociology of literature using a Bordeauxian frame of taste and distinction. Um, more recently, there's also some interesting developments in cultural sociology on, on um, novels as, as social texts and how we can learn about society from literature um, in, in terms of affect and meaning making and, and um, yeah, and, and, and cultural meaning especially. So the second way um, is 
what I call as, as a kind of a vehicle. So people are turning to it as a medium and a vehicle to, to represent research for a variety of aims. So um, some people fictionalize their research findings in order to um, have uh, less transparency around around kind of ethnographic field sites, for instance, to try and protect participants' identities. Um, another reason why people do this is, of course, for teaching and for public engagement. So this includes both people writing fiction themselves as well as drawing on some of those key texts in order to teach ideas in the classroom um, or, or, yes, for, for research translation. And the third kind, which is a much more recent development, is um, fiction as a method. And I mean this as a very um, capital M method approach. So there's kind of really been a notable creative turn recently in, in the world of social research methods. And this is often done um, as scholars picking up arts-based research methods in order to write fiction themselves or is something that's done in a kind of participatory model where, for example, with the story completion method, um, participants are invited to, to finish the story. Is, um, it's very self-explanatory story completion as a method. Um, participants are given, say, a prompt of the start of the story and asked to complete the story. And um, I've done some recent work around this and, and kind of what um, you're interested in finding out is looking at kind of patterns around social imaginaries and things. So getting at those experiences that aren't, um, or getting at people's understanding, sorry, that aren't directly related to their own experiences or don't involve them recounting something that has happened to them personally, um, but trying to engage them in a creative activity that taps into those shared ways of knowing or understanding things. Now I say kind of contemporary turn in capital M method because this trajectory definitely has a very long history. Um, Wolf Lepenese in particular has this really great book called, um, I can't remember what it's called right now. Um, and it looks at the English and the German traditions of sociology and especially the, um, how sociology really developed on a fault line between art and science as kind of method developed and art and science really diverged as, as scholarly fields with science and a kind of um, artistic practice um, through, through creative writing. And well, sociology, arguably, he, he kind of traces this history around the time of Comte intentionally turned to more kind of positivist and um, empirical understandings of of capturing the social world in order to position themselves as more aligned with science rather than literature um, as a kind of strategic development to, to try and differentiate themselves from literary writers, of course, with sociologists and literary writers both being interested in the social world and in, in people's lived experiences. Um, so a very interesting book that really I think provides an important context for, for creative developments in the fields, definitely. Um, and, and kind of shows that it's not necessarily a turn to, to, to creative practice, but a return to, to this uh, shared history. This has been especially strong in the English tradition, arguably, since the start of the 20th century, because H.G. Wells had a really interesting role in the establishment of London's Sociological Society. Of course, today we know Wells as a, um, a sci-fi writer, um, but had had a lot to do with the kind of development of sociology as we know it today in its contemporary form um, um, in that London society. Of course, we've also seen over the past decades this narrative turn, and as I said, the more recent creative turn in social research. And of course, I am, I think, speaking to a room also of anthropologists who know that there is a whole significant history here um, and more important contemporary debates on writing culture across ethnography as a method that is essentially um, concerned with, with writing. Um, there are also some really significant debates on writing that are relevant if you're interested in this work, um, kind of creative writers and journalists and essay writers and things on fact versus fiction, which admittedly I am less interested in than the discussions on the relationship between content and form, kind of looking at um, the literary or the narrative form of writing rather than kind of getting bogged down into arguments around what makes something 
a hard fact and what makes something a kind of hard fiction. So my interest through all of this is both in public facing work. So um, I suppose that's in, in terms of public sociology projects, but also the work that we can do with fiction around, around our public facing identity and around public engagement. Um, but also the internal development of ourselves as scholars and about a kind of a disciplinary vision and way of working. So as I said at the start, I really understand fiction here as both significant in terms of its product and in terms of being a, a process that I think is really valuable and very much complementary to the kind of craft work that Mills talks about. And I think for me, this is why Mills's work on craft is still so relevant and valuable today, because these endeavours on public facing work and our internal development as, as a field are not distinct. So these are three projects that I have worked on over the past couple of years that I wanted to speak to because I think they give some good examples, especially the first two where I'm not talking about my own writing, <laughs> um, into, into the, the power of the kind of work that I'm talking about. So the first is So by Zine, um, which is a zine series that I have been running for the past couple of years that is open for submissions of short stories, poetry, visual art, um, I just published a special issue um, last week, I think, which for the first time included a set of creative essays that I did um, in collaboration with Rob Shields from the University of Alberta and some of his students. Um, we produced that together as a special issue, but all of the other standard issues are microfiction. Um, I like to do a series every now and then of drabbles, which is, which is short stories of exactly 100 words, no more, no less, a real challenge to write. Um, other kind of micro short stories, so up to a thousand words in total, um, written poetry, visual poetry, um, cartoons, other forms of visual art that people submit. So I launched the first one in mid-2017 um, when I was at Goldsmiths for a period of time during my PhD. And for each edition, I have invited somebody whose work has been really influential on my own to contribute a piece of writing and kind of to serve as the inspiration of, for that specific issue. So I theme an, an issue around these scholars' work. And um, these are the people who I'm so fortunate to have had involved so far. Um, Patricia Levy, who I mentioned above, is a real leading proponent of arts-based research. Um, Howard Becker, Les Back, Nirmal Poor, Michael Burrowoy, Raywin Connell, Deborah Lofton, Rob Shields um, have all been involved in the first uh, seven editions so far and I've got a forthcoming edition later this year with Ruha Benjamin. Um, so if you are interested in submitting some microfiction or poetry or visual art this will be open again for submissions um, later in the year. And I'm really committed to SoFi as, a, as kind of an open access space that resists a lot of the things that, um, that academic publishing not necessarily stands for, but, but definitely upholds in its current form. Um, kind of ex exclusion, exclusive practices, exclusionary practices, um, a kind of um, Traditional academic publishing is certainly, I think we can all agree, a less creative space than other spaces where, where we can develop things um, like fiction, for example. Not necessarily a bad thing, but this has really grown this project much bigger than I expected it to, which I think hopefully speaks to a, a real desire for people to be able to practice this kind of work as sociologists and academics and, and use it to extend their creative, their, art, their academic practice in creative ways. Um, so I talk about the zine as being committed to sociological questions and the aesthetic evocation of social meaning. So this is something that I think that sociological fiction can do really well. And rather, kind of rather than the presenting of a sociological argument that's kind of made convincing, even through narrative types of structures as general articles often take, what I think fiction opens up rather than an argument or a conclusion about a particular way that the world is, is that it's a really fertile ground for us to raise sociological questions. And rather than doing that explicitly, this is something that we can evoke in, in the kinds of stories that we choose to write. Um, it's, I call that the aesthetic evocation of social meaning. Um, 
rather than the explication of, of meaning that we are so often used to writing in as a mode as academics. So the seven editions so far, as I said, I theme each edition around these scholars' work and then afterwards I kind of work across the, the pieces submitted to um, write an editorial about what they do as sociological fiction as a, as a, as a unique collection of pieces. So the first one really looked at social fictions, um, the second looked at voice, sensory attentiveness, social alternatives, different ways of imagining the future, um, disciplinary publics and, and our different modes of creativity. Um, this is a very crude measure, but I think sometimes it, it's, it's useful to understand um, if something like this, a zine that I often am cutting and pasting together on the floor of my bedroom after people have emailed me things telling me they've never written anything like this before and they hope it's okay. Um, the, the reach that it has and whether it works is public sociology. Um, this is a very crude measurement, but I've had the same website since launching the very first zine. So I've managed to capture kind of visitors and page views and, and spread of visitors and things. So um, approximately the seven editions of the zine have had 8,000 readers in total. Um, a lot of those are return readers. You can see the page views are 31, 000, over 31,000, so much higher than the unique site visitors. Um, it's not a perfect measure, and I don't even really like quantifying the reach of public sociology in this way, but I think it does give a, um, some insight into the scale of this kind of work and the, the kind of audiences that it can reach. Here's an excerpt from one piece, a short story that was published in the third edition of the zine. Um, and I just wanted to share this excerpt with you. I'll, I'll read it out and then talk about why I like it so much. It's from a story called Unbecoming Strangers by Fabian Canizo. Sally had been working at a call centre for months now. Nothing permanent, she was sure to mention to any prospective employer. Just a casual stint, night relief. But in truth, her contract had mutated into regular 40 hours and upwards weeks. Taking calls was mostly mindless scripted work, but her co-workers brought relief to the droning shifts. On the edges of the city, they were a family of convenience, married in the shared isolation of unsociable hours. At night, the city was clear, almost open. In the grooves of these rhythms, Sally became attuned also to its asynchronicities. An ill manager meant understaffing. A missing bus was 45 minutes of pay docked. The life of the day dwellers had been blessed with unnoticed conveniences. The night transformed a metropolis of abundance into frontier of far out places. This is a brilliant piece. So I highly recommend that you go and check it out. Actually, it's, um, it's a story about somebody doing uh, surreptitious ethnography on public transport and what it's like to be somebody who is being observed while going about your usual life and not necessarily wanting to to have a researcher staring over your shoulder without you knowing. Mm -hmm. Something excellent that I think that this piece does, so this is how Fabian opens a short story and I really love it as an opening to a piece, especially as a sociological kind of fiction, because I think, as I've said here, more than setting a scene, a kind of an introductory opening scene where we get a sense of a place and of the time period that we're in, what Fabian manages to construct is the tempo of a lifestyle. So manages to, to for us to understand all of those kind of sociological ideas about what a lifestyle is and what the significance of thinking of something as a lifestyle means and and brings a sense of pace to that that carries us through it but also makes it really effective so we can feel the tempo of what that lifestyle might feel like to live um yeah i highly recommend reading the rest of it it's a great piece now um, the second project that i that i wanted to mention was fiction at the sociological review so this is an online short story series that i've been editing for tsr since september 2018 so it's nearly been two years that we've that we've had it on the go and we've published 14 stories um, to date so people submit short stories so these are these are longer pieces than in so zine and they're up to three thousand words some slightly push that button that's okay <laughs> um and people also submit a 500 word exegesis with a piece which is a kind of um a critical reflection on the sociological concepts often that are in the story because the kind of explication of, of of what they've tried to do with the story 
um, or they explain the research that it's been based on, so what they're fictionalizing from, or they talk about their process uh, in, in writing the piece. And so in the core, for, in the core which really connects to the Sociological Reviews Manifesto, we, we say that we're seeking fiction that is sociological in style, scope, and sensibility. So we're looking for work that imaginatively extends sociologies of study into fiction. So it's not just necessarily looking for work that kind of effectively fictionalizes from research, but really extends that practice of sociological thinking and, and labor into the writing of fiction as, as a creative practice. So I also wanted to share an excerpt from a piece published there, which is called A Bench at the Side of the Road by J. Emery. Um, this comes towards the end of the piece. So to get a real sense of it, I also recommend that you check out, that you check out this piece in, in the full series. Um, I'll read this as well. So, so this is a piece set in, um, it's set in the UK and it's um, about two young people who have known each other from school and have kind of stumbled upon each other um, at, a, at a bench at the, at the side of the road. For Janie, Claire will never change. No one that leaves do really. You can't exfoliate this place out as if it were dirt in your pores with a bit of a university, a new build house and mojitos with your new mates. No matter how much scrubbing you do, and some have tried, this place is layered in you. All those lauding levers that appear once a year in the Talbot on a Christmas Eve to let everyone know how shit it is to be back, and that they are only here to spend Christmas with their mums and dads, have only plastered over the surface. So like, like the other example that I, that I just read, for me, what makes this fiction really strongly sociological is that more than positioning characters in dialogue, what Jay works to do is develop characterization. So the kind of trajectory of development of his, the people that he writes about in relation to place and in relation to space and cultural rituals and other people. So there's that real kind of, um, there is exactly that relationship that Mills talks about as being central to the sociological imagination between kind of man and society and self and world. And it's the relationships between those kinds of things that are significant in the story. And um, that for me is what really gives it a sociological sensibility. Um, the last project that I'll talk about is my book that I published earlier this year. Um, and this is like the official bubble, the blurb of the book. Really what the book is about is a group of young people who live in Sydney and have finished undergraduate university and are in the process of learning what it means to be as both a young person and an adult and figuring out how to live, how to sustain the things that you care about um, while wanting to hit those kinds of milestones that mark the development of your life beyond being a teenager and beyond being reliant on other people for things. So it kind of captures these young people at a time where they're developing a sense of themselves and asking questions about who they are and what they want. And in the book, what I've tried to work to do is, is to not make these questions that are unique to the characters, but that they are sociological questions. So I, I actually wrote the book as part of my PhD. So, so my, I did a practice-based research project that weaved together um, ethnography, arts-based research, fiction writing, and a literature analysis study. And what, I, what really motivated the project was, I have a background in creative writing, and I kind of stumbled into sociology classes toward the end of my undergraduate degree and in my honors year. And I was absolutely enamored by the way that the literature that I was reading, these kind of great fictional texts, were really illuminated by the sociological theory that I started to study and vice versa. The, the theory was something that I could grasp and felt that I could um, 
I could really see and it changed how I read and it changed how I understood myself and, and how I understood my place in the world around me in, in the world around me. Um, and I would talk to friends who similarly were kind of had been through higher education, were kind of very upwardly mobile, privileged young people who were politically inclined, who had no idea what sociology was, couldn't see the point of it beyond kind of social research that perhaps connects businesses with their target markets better. Um, and couldn't really understand the point of, of why sociology would be significant in the world today. And this was, this was a kind of, I took this very personally <laughs> and I, um, I wanted to know what it was that meant sociology wouldn't stick even in its very simple forms of, of being a way of seeing the world and a way of seeing how micro and macro things connect and the importance of being able to identify those things in, in the functioning of a society. And so what I turned to then was, was art because I thought if, if these more, I don't want to say cold, but I'll say these, these colder forms of public engagement kind of through the news or through, um, through pedagogical avenues of, of teaching students and, and um, these, these other ways that we tend to get political ideas or ideas about the social world that we live in when we don't commit ourselves to studying it or have the luxury of studying it in the same ways. Um, didn't seem to me to be as powerful to try and do the kinds of things that I thought sociology needed to do in order to seem significant to the kinds of people that I was teaching, the young people I was teaching, and also just the other people in my social life. Um, you know, I was really taken by Mills's work on the sociological imagination and I, I wanted to see what it was that would make that imagination important for people, not just kind of the the findings that, that great sociological projects can identify and point to and kind of point to problems in, in these very significant ways. But um, I turned to literature as, as something that could perhaps illuminate the sociological imagination. So I engaged fiction writing as, as a process and, and as a creative method in my PhD, as a form of creative public sociology, both to kind of craft the product that, that could hopefully do this kind of work. That was a, a challenge of, of doing the work, but also as a process to try and use the fiction writing process to understand those contextual limits and the boundaries of Mills's promise. So I used the novel also to interrogate that same social world that I hoped the novel would work within to understand um, the challenges to, to Mills's vision of sociology and, and those kinds of things that would make sociological imagination slippery rather than sticky in, in the kind of public, public world that we live in, in Australia in particular. So the novel is mostly set in Sydney, Australia and follows a group of young people throughout 12 months of life and the narrative is set in the year 2014 and the more micro parts of their characters' everyday lives are entirely fictionalised, but the backdrop that they're set against is not. So there are real events from that year on a national and international scale that, that kind of come through the narrative that are on the news or that they are impacted in um, themselves. So it intentionally weaves together a, a big mix of themes, themes that I was teaching my undergraduates over the, you know, five years that I, four years that I wrote the book, um, but trying to really do so in a way that didn't separate out those themes, which I found something really difficult to communicate to students um, when I was teaching introductory sociology is, you know, when we take this thematic approach to courses, it can be really hard to get students to see the relationships between those different things when by necessity of how a course is structured, we separate them out. So the, the chapters don't align with the theme itself, but really try and um, kind of throw all of these up in, into, a, into a complex mix um, that's hopefully useful in a pedagogical sense, but um, yeah, it's also kind of extends extends beyond that it's it's um unlike some other 
sociological fiction texts that have come out in the past few years. It's not um, purely designed for teaching, but hopefully is useful for teaching. So I just wanted to share one excerpt from the novel um, before I speak to some um, useful theoretical concepts that, that I think are valuable for us to write with rather than necessarily try and illuminate them. So this, is, uh, this comes at the end of chapter eight in the book, which is a scene. So the, the, the protagonist, Taylor, is a primary school teacher. And this is a scene set on a school camp um, where she's gone with her class and, and some other classes. And um, yeah. And this, 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 part of the, this part of the novel is set on the last side of the school camp where they hold a talent show. The last group runners skid about as they loosely introduce Australia. 14 of the 15 potter about the stage, miming a sausage sizzle, thin white red arms of one kid wrapped around another who wriggles like a burning rocket. A small herd of sheep bleating on all fours, a cantering bushman whose top half cracks a whip and the bottom clops along like a horse, and a lifeguard saving people at the beach. One kid, full of cheek, wears a blue singlet, that's the kind that's somehow still called a wife beater, complete with pillow stuffed beer belly and black rubber thongs on his feet. He staggers around the front of the hall, holding a can of Coke, a beer can stand-in that he still would have had to beg one of the camp staff for. The corks hanging off his brown hat knock into one another. He does nothing but swat at mostly unreal bugs, scull the empty can with his head back and pretend to fart, lifting one leg, fanning the air behind his backside. The act is so slick, it's like watching a dog swim out of the deep end of the pool for the first time, an act grown in his bones. Mr Grange loses it. He slaps his knee and wipes his eyes, hooting louder than the rest of the grade combined. Dahl, the boy says when he realises his pull, you've gone and burnt the snags. He points at a sheep and the audience roars, oh, tell him he's dreaming. The group finish with a hand-on-heart delivery of four Peter Allen song, song lines they know from a Qantas ad that aired before they were born, closing their eyes for New York to Rio and old London town, despite few of them having folks who can afford overseas holidays, and with no matter how far or how wide I roam, the whole, the full, the whole full room double belts the final line, screaming the pitch out the second time. I still call Australia home. I still call Australia home. So I think a lot about um, what kinds of sociological concepts we might try and enliven in our, in our sociological fiction writing. As I said with the novel, these are the kinds of themes that I worked with in, in kind of crafting the plot and the characters and, and the events of the story. Um, I also think there are other kinds of concepts that are useful to write with. So not necessarily things that we might seek to illuminate through the narrative, but are things um, like affect and sympraxis that can inform the the motivation and the approach that we might take to doing a project like this and other, and other concepts like the chronotope, which is, is a way of thinking about how we do that more literary construction of a story. So by affect, I think this is a really useful concept circling back to that public sociology stuff that I was talking about at the very start around um, kind of moving beyond public sociology as the effective deliverance of our knowledge to a waiting public and shifting about from thinking of effectivity to a quality of affectivity as something that we can cultivate with, um, with our writing and with an audience, with a reader. Um, and that affectivity is something that we should think of as, as a, something to achieve with creative public sociology. Um, Sympraxis is a linked concept that I found really useful through my PhD project. So this is actually a semiotic concept by Clothler who writes on advertising. And he talks about communication or kind of engaging creative communication as a threefold relationship between discourse, mimesis and sympraxis. And he looks at sympraxis as that part that's beyond um, beyond information as the the quality that elicits change in in the audience a change in understanding a change in behavior um, I think this is something really interesting to think about in terms of Mills's sociological imagination 
what can we do with a fictional text that makes it engaging in a way that we aren't just oh, kind of representing through a story what the sociological imagination is, but it's a quality that through the story we can cultivate with an audience and with a reader. Um, chronotope, as I said, is a slightly different concept, something that I, I find really useful to think about when doing that literary construction work. Um, so the editing and, and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting of fiction. Um, this, is, this is a concept of Buckton who calls the chronotope literally time space. So he's talking about the unity of time and space, the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships as they are artistically expressed in literature. And he specifically talks about fiction for all of this book um, in, a, in a really useful way. And he talks about chronotopes as the organizing centers for the fundamental narrative events of the novel. So the way that a scene comes together in, in a way that's both a setting and an action. So thinking about how we unite time and space in, in key scenes. Um, because these, these are the key scenes throughout a narrative that kind of shapes meaning. And it's through these that we can evoke meaning um, through the aesthetic form of, of the story and, and, and shape the narrative. I think I've gone over 40 minutes, so I might leave it there. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ash. That was lovely. And um, I think maybe, you know, can challenge us all to try in a different style of writing. Maybe the hundred word story, guys. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any questions, it's somebody. Katie, you want to start? Thank you. I enjoyed that so much. I, um, <laughs> when, when, when I was like, a baby, all I've wanted to be was a fiction writer. And then I got sick of writers writing about writing. And so I decided that I'd have an interesting career prior to becoming a fabulous fiction writer. And, you know, here I still am in that quality. But um, just more information that you want. Um, so what I'm really interested in is to pick your brain, I guess, on process. So I find um, that, and this is probably like, it will, you know, show how much I'm not a writer in the creative sense, because I find that I, sort of have moments of uh, divine inspiration. There's the um, non-religious uh, <laughs> sort of when it comes to creative writing, whereas I can write till the cows come home and sort of just as a matter of discipline for um, more academic pieces. So, and, and I find that in some ways, like when I, when I had a couple of years out of academia, then I did a lot of creative writing. And I, I don't know, somehow I feel, which is um, possibly just an elaborate means of procrastination, that the, the academic writing brain blocks the creative writing brain somehow. So I'm super interested in how you manage to negotiate those sort of two different, you know, sort of genres um, and how you actually do that on a really practical day-to-day -day level. And also just was really interested. So, you know, I noticed that you published with Brill, which is more, I guess, of an academic publisher generally. So I'm really interested also in how you made that decision and also to say massive congratulations because I, I understand it's much, much harder <laughs> to get fiction. Oh, thanks. <laughs> than it is um, academic work. So thank you. I really, really enjoyed that. Oh, thanks so much. Well, I'll go to the second question first. That's an easier one. So I published my novel in this amazing series called the Social Fiction Series. So it is a series by Brill that is edited by Patricia Levy. And it is only for novels and plays that are the outcomes of social research. So it was an easy home for me for this one because I produce a novel as part of a PhD and because it was such an um, intentionally sociological endeavour. Um, so that's where I publish that. So if you're working on something similar to this and, um, and you have like a play or a novel that you're writing, I highly recommend that you do reach out to Patricia. She's wonderful and very, very generous with her time, especially with, re with regards to this series in particular. Um, also check out the series because there's, there's heaps, I think mine is like the 20 something or 30 something in the series. So there's quite a lot of um, pieces already been um, published in the series. So do check it out. Um, on process, this is an interesting question to me since finishing this novel. So while I was doing my PhD, I was very much a proponent of um, my creative and my scholarly labours are very similar and we need to stop thinking about them as separate things. Um, since finishing my PhD and now 
kind of being a postdoc full time. Um, part of that I have come to realize was a privilege of doing a PhD in that I had dedicated time, years dedicated to developing my scholarly understandings and producing a novel. This was kind of my only really primary focus. And so I had the time to sit at the desk and, and treat it like a job. And they very much came together for me in that. Um, the new project that I'm working on is almost a completely different haphazard approach. Um, as, as, as you said, it's um, so far has come to me in moments of divine inspiration. It's definitely not a job writing the second novel because now I have a job. <laughs> so my, um, yeah, it's, I suppose it's so my brief, my brief reflections on that then is that it depends on the project. And, and um, yeah, the, the second novel that I'm working on it will be a, a much more, I think, partly challenging process in terms of writing where I'm sitting down for kind of a rushed few hours where I have an idea of something to write and contribute to the novel. And I blurt it all out. Um, I haven't yet hit the piece where the, the, the my stride with the with the story where I know where it where it's going and I'm ready to sit at the desk every day and write. Um, although I do try and take that great enduring writer's advice that writing only happens when you're sitting at the desk and getting to the desk is the hardest thing. So um, yeah, in terms of actually getting words on a page, that's the only advice that I would have and is a process that I myself need to stick to. Um, and the the kind of difference or the bringing together of scholarly and literary work is a very much a work in progress for me. Awesome, thank you, that, that's great. Just, um, just before I go, have you come across, um, it's a new, we had Anand Pandian come and speak with us um, in this series a few weeks ago and he's just had a beautiful um, ethnographic fiction, um, poetry, etc. Uh, edited volume come out called Crumpled Paper Boat, have you heard of that? Oh, cool, no, I don't think so. Beautiful, and then he's also got another um, another edited volume called Anthropocene Unseen, which also has really beautiful, creative, very very short pieces that you might find rather lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Frida, did you have your hand up? Sorry, I just unmute myself. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Ash, that was really interesting. Um, thanks. So. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, it would be really interesting to see how many um, people with sociology or anthropology majors also double majored in literature, which mm. I, I'm one of them. Um, and, you know, I, I sometimes joke that, that it, doing English literature kind of knocked out any creative bone that I might have had in my body. But then I noticed that in my sociological writing that I, I am reasonably creative. So my question is around what, yeah, what, what makes the novel, I, I know you've tried to explain what makes fi fiction sociological, but I'd like to know well, what, what fiction is not sociological. Um, you know, I, Cloud Atlas, The City and the City, mm. um, you know, uh, Am Amitav Ghosh's books, uh, Where the Crawdads Sing, you know, the, all, all of these novels, you know, get, provide not just insights into the human psyche, but also into into the social social world and that they construct social worlds that have all of the phenomena that we study um, and I you know I've, I've done some work kind of looking at, at um, political cartoons and I'm amazed at how much sociology there is in a single cartoon but that doesn't inspire me to become a political cartoonist because I know that I can't draw so so I see my you know what I do is sociology as, as a sociologist so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just not convinced that, that sociologists should necessarily um, be, be trying to take on an, another form of communication, which may not be their forte, um, when novelists do it just as well as, as we might. Um, so that's a bit of a devil's advocate kind of question. For no, it's a key question that I've really thought a lot about and you'd be surprised how many people have asked about it and that I've talked with about it. Um, I think there are some, for me, relatively arbitrary lines that we can draw between 
novels that we as sociologists can read and say this is so sociological versus versus texts that are intentionally written as as a form of sociology um i i wholeheartedly agree with you that that you know and other people have argued long before me that possibly every fictional text that exists is kind of sociologically significant and ripe for sociological analysis um I'm, and I don't, I don't necessarily want to advocate that that a, a sociologist should kind of all take up fiction writing as if it's something very easy to do. Um, I very much know that it's it's something that I do because I'm effectively trained in it. I have studied some years studying creative writing um, before you know before I came to sociology really. So. I suppose for me, what's what's really useful about it is that for people who do want to write creatively, and there are a surprising, still surprising for me, amount amount of social researchers who do want to write creatively or do already write creatively, um, is is thinking about how we can do that, not just to communicate our research with others, but as something that we can fold into the many kinds of practices that we already do to kind of strengthen our work as, as sociologists. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of other practices that people do, even from keeping a research diary. Um, I think writing fiction is something that can, can complement that internal labour that I talked about that, that I think can be really useful for our own development um, and also for our development with students in the classroom around sharpening that sociological imagination when we're first developing it. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a hard one about kind of what is and what isn't sociological and and um, whether kind of a text written by a sociologist is any more sociological than something written by a by a literary writer. A key difference for me, I will say, in between, I mean, I just I read so much, so this isn't a systematic uh, analysis of of these texts by any means. But from all of the work that I have read. A key difference for me from the literature that I read to the to kinds of characters that, that sociologists write is that the climax of a narrative in some of our great works of literature essentially boils down to an agentic individual triumphing or try like triumphing over over an issue. Even Oops, sorry, dropped my headphones. Um, even when that issue is kind of paid a very careful and attentive attention to as a societal issue, a lot of these great narratives, especially a lot of great contemporary literature, is still comes down to um, an almost individualistic resolution of the narrative in order for the story to finish. Something that I like that, that fiction writers who are sociologists do is they resist that. They're at, a, at critical points in the narrative, there is a resistance to that turn to individualization, which is arguably a, a result of our kind of Western narrative structures of how to structure a story altogether. Um, yeah, but but that's been one of the more interesting things to me is is thinking in some of the ways that they they do resist that, and then that's where they bring that sociological um, understanding to bear in the in the narrative structure. Hey, sounds good. Thank you, um, <laughs> Sam. You did put a question in the chat. Hmm. Did you want to ask that still? Or did you want us to just read it and? Get Ash to ask it. I can read it out. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got no mic. There we go. You want to just read it out and then answer it. One of the fundamental problems of studying human beings is their unknowability and ambiguity. We can never have total observation of people and we can never know what happens in people's minds outside their own inevitably partial reports. Conversely, fiction routinely presents a level of insight into characters that can never be reached in real life. For many people, that's a large part of appeal. Yeah. When fictional people are ambiguous or unknowable, this is the result of purposeful aesthetic choices rather than the problem of uncertain scope that inevitably emerges from the messy constraints of the real world. How can or should this contradiction be resolved? Mm, that's a big question. Um, 
Yeah, Sam, you're very right. This kind of craft of it, crafting of interiority is, I think, one of the best things that fiction can offer sociologists. Um, in, in a way to kind of get at the motivations and, and ways that people make a meaning in their lives without falling perhaps into that more um, psychological understanding of, of individuals' behaviour, which we are so resistant to as, as social researchers, is kind of leaning on those ways of understanding the individual often. Um, and yeah, and like you said, that interiority is, is really intentionally engaged with in different fictional texts, either as a way of getting insight into people or as may kind of an intentional opaqueness that's, that's crafted by the writer. Oh, rather than the problem of uncertain scope that inevitably emerges from the messy constraints of the real world. I don't know how this contradiction can be resolved, but I think all we can really do in, in trying to write this kind of work or learn from what fictions, fiction writers do is try and make sense of the choices that the writer has made in when they do obscure um, or make ambiguous characters' motivations versus when they do attentively craft that interiority and, um, and, and kind of think about it in terms of who's not only whose voices are heard, but who's, who's um, yeah, who, who those more personal insights and, and things are, are privileged in a narrative. I don't know how we can resolve it. I don't, I have no idea how to answer your question, but it's definitely something that I think is really significant in fiction, especially for sociologists and, and something that we can, um, that is, would be really valuable for us to kind of learn from it and pay attention to as a, something that writers in, intentionally engage with and, and specifically craft for lots of reasons. Okay, thank you. Thank